All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for tuning in today. Special thanks to our panel speakers for taking the time to join us and also InterSystems as well for uh, sponsoring this webinar. Now, data is at the center of innovation for many industries and wealth management is no exception. From enabling data-driven decisions to creating entirely new business models, unlocking the value of data has been core to the success of a lot of wealth management and wealth tech firms. But is the industry truly harnessing the power of data? Today, we're joined by a panel of practitioners who will be sharing with us how they have utilized data successfully within their own organization. So on the top, we have Ned. Ned is the CEO and founder of Bamboo. Below Ned, we have... Hey, Ned. Below Ned, we have Michael. Michael is the head of financial solutions for InterSystems. Below Ned, we have Sachin Tong, who is the director for data. And then advanced analytics and privacy at Standard Chartered Bank. And below Sachin, we have Dr. Seka, who is the head of uh, uh, the director for digital strategy for Kedangna Bank. Thank you for joining us, guys. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Glad you're all here. So before I begin, I'd like to remind the audience who's tuning in live today uh, to feel free to ask questions at any time. Now, those of you who've regularly been attending our show knows that we like to keep this fairly casual. So as you ask questions, we'll try to address, him, address them as we go along. So maybe let's start by uh, talking about a, a broad overview of where the wealth management industry is right now in terms of the ways that they utilize data to, to realize value. Maybe we can start from Ned on the top there. Ned, can you give us a broad overview of where we are at, at the moment? Absolutely. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and uh, Vincent and uh, the other panelists as well. I would say we're still really at the beginning of using data effectively in wealth management. Why do I say that? Because I think there's two sets of data. Clearly, there's the data we've all been used to, right, which is the pricing data, the price of assets, you know, all of the, 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 the values, NAVs of assets. And I think you know, that everyone understands in the industry that data how it should be used. But where I think we have a huge opportunity is in using data to effectively enhance our customers' financial goals. So today, I think that for a lot of wealth managers, even when a customer is buying a fund or buying an ETF, really, what is the outcome for the customer? Really, it, it's unknown. Does the customer achieve their goals? Does the product? Because in essence, People don't buy wealth management products for the sake of the product themselves. They buy it for the outcome, which is a better financial life and achieving financial goals. And this is where data comes in. I think we're right at the beginning with the intersection of technology, people doing digital banking, people sharing their information, that it's. I think it's going to be a huge boom for the wealth management industry because not only now will people buy in saving and investment products, mutual funds and ETFs, because they think they should and it'll increase their, their you know, uh, savings, data will be able to say, we can accurately show you how you can bring your goals forward. We understand how much you save. We understand what your goals are. And so where I would, you know, and so basically the customer is going to have a much better experience by having data integrated from all the different, you know, e-wallet, digital banking, saving investment areas. So my view, we're right at the beginning, a lot to talk about. And I think over the next five to 10 years, we'll see a pretty seismic shift in how people consume wealth management. Thank you. And I guess at the end of the day, it's really about the customer, right? Whatever technology you use is just about driving outcomes. And in, in the context of wealth management, it's always about whether you are able to help them to meet the financial goals. Thank you for raising those points. Um, let's move on over to Mike. Mike, what is your view? What are your views on this, Mike? So I'm in fair agreement with Ned. Um, I think it's pretty early days overall. Um, I do think that it's kind of because there's a shift of how people look at things, right? So it's really kind of now, I think firms now realize that they have to look um, outside in um, versus inside out. So if you think about it that way, it's more about like, how do you create a business strategy and our approach to kind of really um, adapts to what, adapt your products and your services that you offer more to what the customer wants, 
how they want it, when they want it, right? It's, I think as Ned said, it's, it's about customer centricity, right? It's really about all about the customer. And you know, and to do that, there's, there's, there's a big shift of what they have done in the past. And so now I think they all realize has become more data driven. That, that, that's a pretty easy one. I think firms are recognize that either early or late. Um, they're at different maturity levels as to how, how they have shifted. <clears throat> um, but you know, I think they're starting to solve their data problems. Um, they, they, they're looking for an agile platform, trying to figure out how, to, how can they get all the various types of data in, uh, the volumes of data, whether it's kind of the trading data, as, as Ned mentioned, the, the real-time data, but it's also the unstructured data and they're getting real rich data around um, kind of their social media pieces, even kind of think about life events and bring all that together. Uh, and then using kind of your, your modeling capabilities, your AI, your MLs, and really kind of get that really rich customer experience, right? Really, again, coming back to knowing more about the customer and what they want and offering that to them, right? Like say a, a person has a, as a kid, wants to offering things specific to that, right? And I think there's 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 a lot of things coming out, um, and it's immensely um, beneficial to all the customers, right? And I think firms realize that that's where where they have to head. For sure, I think we're dealing with more unstructured data now than ever before, and and how how to translate that. In, into insights that will help the customers would be key moving forward. So thank you for that, Mike. Um, Sachin, you, you have the floor. Can you give us a sense of where the industry is at at the moment? No, I think, uh, first of all, couldn't agree more with, with the other panelists, Ned and Mike has summarized very well. So <clears throat> it's it's very challenging when 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 two of the panelists has shared such a great um, you know thought and and now the, the the challenge is how to build on top of it, right? So so uh, thanks guys for putting me on this challenge, uh, challenging situation. So I, I think my, my, my perspective is um, data is the new oil. Everybody has accepted it, right? And everybody is trying to uh, be data driven ap uh, approaches of, of either the product design or enhancing customer experience. So from a wealth management perspective um, and um, is 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 all about how to minimize the risk and and Ned nicely summarized to achieve the financial goals right so one of the 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 key goal is to minimize the risk and at the same time you you can use your historical data and you can use a lot of data points to actually uh, come up and and demonstrate that the product offering what uh, uh, you are offering to the client is is not riskier or is as much more safer so i think um my my uh, uh, thought process will be that this is a good opportunity to use data and to actually uh, promote uh, uh, customer confidence from on the on from the risk appetite perspective thank you for that sachin um I, I think that's that's always the challenge coming after, and, and the one with the biggest challenge right now is Dr. Seko is uh, <laughs> building on top of that after everyone. But Dr. Seko, what is, what is your view in terms of where we are in the industry? And perhaps you could also kind of zoom in into what's happening in, in Malaysia where you operate. Uh, okay, so basically I agree with all the other panelists. Uh, very, it's also a tough challenge, but let's look at the context of uh, wealth management itself. Today, wealth management is more about goal setting, risk management, uh, risk profile management, and also your investment management. However, if you really look at it, this is not wealth management, it's just wealth creation, right? So in the context of wealth management, you have to include data from lifestyle, spending, uh, expenses, uh, things like insurance is not into wealth management uh, actively yet. A lot of data, even your motor insurance is also part of how you're spending your money and all those things. So this, this whole lifestyle of your customers, that data needs to grow into them. And once it, it is ingested, then it has to mature. I think that's when uh, wealth management will be true wealth management and it's still... I would say at a very much infancy level and it's still at stage of wealth creation level and protection of that wealth creation and investment. 
it still has not gone to true wealth management yet. Thank you for that, Dr. Seka. You know, uh, what I noticed when during these sessions, at the start of the session, all the panelists tends to agree with each other. <laughs> As we go along only then we're like, oh, okay, you know, there's some diverse, uh, like divergent views here and there. Okay, cool. So um, I think let's kind of zoom into how your organization is uh, specifically applying data. So maybe we can hand the floor back to Ned. And Ned, you know, being a B2B, sort of robo-advisor solution provider. How, how are you using data in your organization and helping your customers to, to use data? Okay, uh, so uh, you mentioned Vincent and maybe we will disagree. So I might provide some uh, fodder for the panelists to disagree on because we're trying, we're about to try, well, we've been working on something for the past couple of years. So I'll describe it and happy to hear some view how we use data. So maybe a bit of context, you know, we talk about robo and I think people have a basic, idea, you know, not basic, excuse me, but they have an understanding of what it is. We call it robo 1.0. It's a, a app that allows you to put in some criteria, your age, income, your perceived risk profile, and it will select you a few funds and then you will buy them and transact, right? And, you know, we've seen that's been successful, Betterment, Wealthfront, stash away out here. You know, we design and build those. But over the, so for the first two or three years that we built, the data that we ingested was pretty simple data, your income, your location, pretty straightforward, right? But what we started to notice was that Robo 1.0 was already becoming expected, like table stakes, right? Like a Robo, oh, you just have to have a Robo. It's like you're a bank, you must be digital, right? It's just, it's table stakes. So how do you take it further? So actually before this, we were discussing Vincent, my co-founder, apart from being a fan of Japanese history, is also a fan of the future. So he's a fan of the far distant past and he's a far, fan of the far in, in the future. So we've been working on something called predictive financial planning. And so we plan to use data, and this is something we actually don't believe that people are the, so we don't believe that individuals are the right people to understand their own retirement, their own risk, or their own choices of managing money. In fact, history has shown us that people are actually very bad at managing money and making investment choices. In, indeed, in America today, almost 50% of people run a cash flow negative life. So history shows that people just aren't good at wealth management. We know this. So why would we build a robo that says, hey, tell us your risk, tell us your diversification, tell us how much you need for retirement? People don't know. So we've been working on an idea called predictive financial planning. And the idea is this, is that if we can understand, we will go to, you know, again, all approved, you know, with data protection laws, understand your spending habits, your lifestyle, your education, your income, your kids, where you live, we'll show you your three possible future paths. We don't, we're not going to ask you the way we're going to, because if we ask you in general, most mass retail get it wrong anyway. So why would we ask the idea about using data? Think about it. If Google launched a wealth manager, do you think they would ask you how much you spent or what your risk is or what your retirement goal is? Google knows it will just tell you, Hey, you know, whether it's Mike or Sachin or, or Dr. Seka, Hey guys, we've analyzed all of your data. We know what your future life is likely to be. Financial planning is predictable will do it for you. So our use of data going forward is, is to take it out of the hands of the customer, particularly in mass retail, and try to show them the realities. Because historically, people aren't very good at wealth at, at, at saving and investing. That's how we plan to use data going forward. Thank you for that. Let's see if everyone shares the same view. But I guess, you know, that's also part of the design of the education system, right? Because even all the way up to university, they don't really even teach you to do taxes, what more, how to actually invest your money and whatnot. So that's 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 one consideration. Mike, what's your view on this? And, and how how is uh, InterSystems uh, using data and actually helping your customers to better harness data? Yeah, so Ned has a very interesting view there. And I, I actually fortunately agree with it. Um, I'll, I'll take the question slightly differently. Um, I'll look at it from a customer standpoint. Right? I think that, again, coming back to that richness of experience, right? Um, they're going to get new ways of interacting. And I think that's good because the, I, I think that the, the things that people want in the past, so and and they they hold a lot of the wealth now, as they move forward and either transferred through inheritance or in some form it gets transferred, 
the you know the new a new generations will have a different view, and so you know having a, a diversified way of uh, or a diverse, diversified a client advisor relationship, you know around you know some people are going to just want fully automated like give me self-service like heck with talking with anyone i i hate talking to people um yeah you can even then do kind of like the other spectrum is like i want to continue talking to a person i trust people I, you know people is great i love talking like i'm in a pandemic i want to talk to someone um and then there's the hybrid in between right so it's a little bit of you know 40 percent automated 60 percent human or or some combination of that right and i think that that is great, right? Because it tailors to what people want, and then it comes to hyper personalization. I think that's where Ned's going at. <clears throat> you know, knowing what you want, even if you don't know it, right? Or if you do know, right? And, and I talked about that first that that life event, right? Yeah, you know, it could be something else, right? If if we can kind of piece piece together all this information. You know, I, I think a machine in, 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 you know, with enough training and enough time can figure out uh, um, suggestions, right? I'll, I'll put it as suggestions. I won't go as far, right? Um, and I, I think that's very useful, right? Because it just guides people, gives guidance. Um, we can do the social aspect. I'm going to leave that out because you can gain, gain, gain um, confidence through you got social discussions and that so forth. Um, and then from the institutional side, um, Man, I mean, you can expand your user base, like your your customer base. You, you really would know more about them. You can know what they want, and then you can bring them on board, right? Um, and I, I talked about how how you can scale, right? Because just imagine an advisor comes in, right? Like how much how much how how many clients can a one advisor take on? Well, with some help, um, some advice, and some insights that were given to him immediately. He could probably service a lot more. He or she could service a lot more, right? So, you know, I think there's a lot to be said around that. Um, you know, we're working with some clients around, you know, just figuring out, uh, you know, understanding those events in their life. Like, you're going to close your account. We want to stop that. As a firm, one of our firms that we're working with, they want to stop that. They don't want you to close out your account. We want to know ahead. You may not be forthcoming and telling us, but what if we were able to help you and come to you and say, hey, uh, you know, maybe you lost your job, you know, maybe, maybe there's something going on, and maybe you need a loan or, or something of that form, you know, some sort of financial capability that you're, you're seeking, but you didn't want to kind of talk. Maybe we offer that up front, right? And, and that, that kind of ability, you know, it helps with customer retention, you know, that, cust that personalization really kind of is, um, things that I think are very useful that, that we're working with our customers on. So what I'm sensing you're saying is that, you know, there are a few ways that you go about harnessing it, right? Number one is to enable advisors to, to kind of work hand in hand with the AI to provide better customer experience, to being able to drive retention and, and a variety of things. And I think, you know, especially for advisors these days where they're doing 10, 15 video calls a day versus going out, that that, that is even more important for them to be able to serve, right? And I'm yeah. sure a lot of clients are experiencing that. Yeah, and, and what we're trying to do is like, if you pull up a customer, they're going to give you a whole bunch of recommendations because we're taking in all that unstructured data. We have the structured data coming in. But pulling it all together, you know, coming up with insights around that person to give you suggestions what you should talk to them about if you're you know, doing still doing the face to face, right? It, it kind of really kind of makes a richer experience for the customer, right? Human or fully automated. Very cool. Thanks for sharing your views, Mike. Let's move on to Sachin. And, and Sachin, you know, one thing that I'm particularly um, glad and also interested on this is the fact that your title has the word privacy in it and that kind of shows like you know the importance the growing importance of privacy in this data driven kind of world so maybe you can speak a bit to that and also walk us through how you are deploying and utilizing uh, data within standard charted you have the floor Sachin. yeah so i think um um not specific to any organization, but I, th I think the fundamental is everybody's trying to become data-driven organization. That that's that's it. And you know, and coming back to Ned and Mike, um, you know, 
that is a very interesting uh, topic about predictions, right? Using the data to predict. And I, I would say taking the power from the customer in the right sense, in the positive sense, you know, that yet, hey, just 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 accept it that you not, you are not good and there are we are taking this power out because we want we want to help and we want to enable you or we want to educate you i, th I think that that's a that's a that's a million dollar statement and i couldn't agree more than that and mike as well the the the, the how, how do you enable or how do you break the ice to talk up front if you are struggling so this is this is very very important and very interesting and coming back to your uh, your your question about you know the ways of using ai and machine learning and this is this is a a question which can actually take days of discussion there are multiple use cases right i, I don't think so i'll be able to justify or give a justice in 2 minutes or 3 minutes but i'll try my best so so two key points which i want to talk about is uh, build on top of net is predictive or prediction right and it is not only in the area of wealth management i want to give a different perspective also because net has given already wealth management every organization has some kind of risk appetite and risk management to do that bfsis are very for insurance companies and all those things are they want to make sure that they are regulatory aligned compliant and all those things so in my previous organizations what i've done also is we have actually taken up the historical data maybe 5 years 7 years 10 years depending on that breach data we we based on the predictive models which is available and it is not like a rocket science anymore uh, thanks to technology there's is a kind of plug and play you understand your data make the make available of that data of 5 7 10 years push it into the models and see what kind of predictions you are getting and then you you identify which models you would like to further train so that you you and based on that predictions you tell the story you tell the story to your management hey next 6 months this is the kind of landscape of the risk do we need to make some policy changes or do we need to make some announcements or do we need to make our staff train so that we actually are 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 Uh, so i think predictive not only from a wealth management perspective from a risk perspective also doing predictions is an eye opener and you know it is it is just like you know food for thought the other use case um, is all about customer experience and both of both of the panelists i'm sure um, um dr sega also will will uh, talk about uh, some experiences we are talking about uh, ned said a very nice statement that i want to talk to humans i want to talk to people i'm i'm stuck in the pandemic right what we are trying to do is chatbots we is is there robots are there we are also thinking about digital avatars which is which is coming on where actually you talk to the you, you you it is just like you are talking to the human not not you are typing or something like that you are having a conversation right and and you and and through 3d and your ai and machine learning you are actually um uh, getting a feeling that you are talking to a human being because the face the the body expression is 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 as good as talking to to a human being without compromising on the social distancing and the regulations we are in i i wrote one article on 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 one of the um, uh, um abp news article for for media houses as well what is the future and one interesting thing which which i mentioned is that just just imagine a situation where we have a digital avatars to 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 communicate the news to us for example if i if i like angela jolie right and uh, i want she should be giving me the news the content is the same but i would like to see or i i want my hollywood star or a bollywood star to 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 share that it's but it is now possible it is very much possible because you can capture it uh, the facial expressions and you can make the digital avatar get the content in the same voice modulation what what they can do and the same body gestures it is there so again boils down to the customer ex experience personalization and i think the word is hyper personalization and all those things so i think we can do magic with with machine learning and ai that that's 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 my my view point I mean personally I I definitely would want Angelina Jolie to be delivering fintech news stories. <laughs> I think it'd be far more interesting than 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 in my face but uh let's see if that's a reality that's um coming close. But I'm 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 curious though. I mean of course back in those days where you have this digital avatar one of the big issues is the the whole uncanny valley right. So that I think to a large extent has been kind of improved on a lot but is the interaction still does it feel natural has all, all this kind of uh, digital avatars reached a stage where they kind of pass the turing test 
No, I think uh, um, we have made some great advancement using technology, and 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 you will be soon realizing maybe in coming few months or maybe end of the year you will be seeing the adoption of this this whole concept mm. Uh, mm. much more. And um, mm. yeah, um, but but I, I'm I'm very positive, and I have seen some some prototypes, and I have mm. I have attended some some workshops as well. Where actually organizations are uh, uh, signing up their uh, uh, their brand ambassadors and they are working with them to create their avatars and and pushing it and and this is this is is gonna be soon reality. It is it is a reality. The only it's just a matter of time when it comes to adoption. And I I, I didn't touch upon the topic of data privacy, which is which is also very important. And I'll. I'll in in 30 seconds i would like to share with with one example whatsapp rolled out uh, that they will be sharing the data with the parent company of facebook mm -hmm. it 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 was such a such a big issue that they had to stop that rollout right they mm -hmm. they have to go back on 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 the drawing board and start it all again again going back is data privacy is is very important customers are very much educated and they are they 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 want to know how their data is being used so they expect transparency and and organizations have a legal and moral responsibility to mm -hmm. to use the data uh, uh in in the in the way the customer has agreed to and i don't know whether you guys and i'm sure you apple and facebook the two different philosophies are fighting together on 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 the point mm -hmm. of data very interesting where where tim is is talking about that hey we are not here to capture your data mm -hmm. our fundamentals are not to capture data we want to actually protect your data the philosophies are different on the other mm -hmm. other hand the facebook wants to capture your data use it for your marketing and 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 push that thing so i think um, from a data privacy perspective, it is very important, and every and the organizations who are uh, uh, capturing the data and making sure that the data is secure and used in the right way mm. will see uh, more more uh, customer trust rather than the the organizations which are doing you know not being very transparent on this. So very interesting topic again. Thank you, Sachin. I think I, I would be interested to dive into that a little bit more with the other panelists as well. Uh, but let's quickly move on to uh, Dr. Seka to uh, get his views and, and, and insights on how he is using data to deliver customer value or utilizing it within Kananga Bank. Uh, Dr. Seka, what, have you, what are your thoughts? Well, there are two stages of us using data. I think now we are now at the stage of building blocks. But we um, we are doing it with the intent of we know where we want to go with that building blocks and what's the value of the data that we want to do. Um, personalization is one uh, area that we're looking at. And uh, if you look at Kananga had an investment into uh, merchant trade, which is a digital wallet. This is where lifestyle information gets into uh, for us to understand our customers. We also know that our customers put in money for investment, but they don't invest every day. So they have money sitting there. So we want to make sure that they earn money and it's also liquid for them to utilize if they need to without having to close account and take out the money. So this is understanding customer needs and uh, they can continuously have uh, better returns with us and have the same liquidity as well. We are also using data to do predictive analysis right and this is not prediction of customers behavior yet but more of predictive of uh, how the investment would give us better returns right because at the end of the day no matter what kind of wealth management that you're doing the customer is not only buying a life goal life goal uh, or investment and everything they build trust with you if you can deliver them profitability they are buying profitability if you do your goals reach and everything, but if you can't give them the returns that they expect in their mind, or you can't win their trust with that profitability, then uh, you will lose the game, right? So what we want to do is we want to enhance, use data to enhance our understanding of that predictive. Can we deliver that profitability? Can we, do we understand the market better? So once we have, we already started that, and once we have done that, 
We want to expand it to our customers. We want to expand it to our intermediaries so that they can manage the customers better, right? So we we believe that we need to get our act right before we get our customers act right. And uh, we are now in that building blocks. And uh, it, I guess we would soon get it right with the customer. And we are starting with our customer before we expand to the other customers, the un underserved customers. Uh, in the pipeline, we are also going to jump into the robo-advisory uh, bandwagon, uh, ho hopefully soon, very shortly, soon. Uh, it's in the final stages. And, um, and, and the predictive also, it's already there. And most for, we will look at uh, empowering our intermediaries with that as well. So that's where we are. And, and in our partnership with Rakuten, uh, what we do is we do a lot of data from customer behavior, how they are trading, how they are, how they are interacting with us. And we have a continuous improvisation on how our value proposition to the customer is and everything. So uh, we are also planning to do another disruptive uh, uh, launch soon in that perspective as well. Thank you, Dr. Asaka. And to provide context to those of you who may not be so familiar with what's going on in Malaysia, uh, Rakuten and Kenanga set up a, a joint venture called Rakuten Trade, which is a digital equities broker, just to provide some context for some who may not be familiar. So um, that actually segues quite, segues quite nicely into uh, one of the questions from the audience. So I'm going to take this question and then we're going to jump into the privacy discussion because I think that's a very important discussion. Um, and this question would be quite uh, suited for Dr. Seka to, to take it and also maybe the rest can uh, ex expand on it based on their own uh, perspective of the region as well. So Ashish uh, is asking, uh, in order for RoboAdvisor to analyze personal data, it, it needs a API infrastructure to be ready. So I guess the question is whether BNM is ready for this, but it's not just BNM, right? Because it involves multiple agencies across the government. Uh, so Dr. Seka, what's your view on, on how ready we are in, in this context? Yeah, I think uh, there are two parts of this when you talk about personal data. At this point, um, in Malaysia, the legislation is as such that uh, no matter your IC number and your personal data, actually it doesn't belong to the government, it belongs to you. So the government is also an intermediary that's collecting your data, but they don't own the data. So they can't create the API to actually share it with any entity. They can tell, do they can do validation, but they can't give it to you kind of thing. So so I think the uh, the last time I spoke to some government agency, I think they are in the process of uh, working on the legislation first before they can start doing that. And if the government is already working on the legislation, that means they are uh, looking at um, making the, the whole uh, government more uh, easier to interact with, right? Uh, I was involved in the in drafting the national AI framework for the government as well. Uh, the government's initiatives are way ahead of what we want to do, not, not only for fintechs or financial management, but also even to the extent of data, uh, predicting better career placements and a lot of things. So they have the idea right, but the legislation is, is a long process for them to change, right? So uh, as I, as you said, BNM moving towards that, uh, I guess regulators uh, biggest challenge is not only enabling business, but how do they enable business and also monitor the governance because regulators role is not about only enabling business, but protecting the investor. So they have our investors money in mind when they do regulation. So they, there are so many laws already in Malaysia, like the Anti-Competition uh, Com Competition Act and everything, so that not one organization can monopolize a customer and there must be uh, competition, fair competition and everything. And you would have seen Mars and AHA being fined for ticket pricing as well, right? So, so I guess customer protection by the government is the primary cause of why data privacy is still uh, not widely uh, being allowed. I mean, it's protected to a certain extent, but there's no restriction from the customer to share their data with any organization. Mm -hmm. So that's where 
I think organizations need to build trust and not wait for regulators to uh, build that trust for your customers and give it to you. So sure. I think the onus is on organization at the, at the moment. Of course. Yeah, maybe let's jump to Ned to also share his views on the scene in, in Singapore and whether or not the infrastructure is ready. Ned, what, what, what is your Thank views? You. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for bringing me in there, Vincent. And to Ashish's question, do you need open API infrastructure to allow that personalization of data? And I think Dr. Sekar, it's a good point. Yes, you can wait for the regulations. And of course, everybody has to follow the regulations, but customers can take the option themselves to share that data, right? If a customer feels by sharing the data in the right way, he'll get a better outcome, then they should be allowed to do that. And I think it's always a bit of a push and a pull, right? Absolutely, regulations are key. You know, we've got to do everything. It's got to be regulated in the right way. But I think regulations also, you know, honestly, I think of all the jobs in the world today, being a regulator is pro in finance is probably one of the hardest because clearly there's a move to data, right? Yet regulators are like, hold on, I want to get this right. So mm -hmm. to, to, the, to the question, do you need open API infrastructure to share? Yes, you do. Does it only have to come from the regulator? I don't think it's fair to put on the regulator, hey, it's all on you to work it out. And the reason I say this, so I'm going to, uh, Sachin, you use the word magic. It's my favorite word. And I'm going to read, forgive me, I'm not looking at my phone, but I'm going to read a quote. And this is why I think we should move on to privacy, but it's super hard to work it out. So, and I'm just reading again, I'm not, I'm not so uh, I love this quote, I'm gonna get it right. In 1962, in his book, Profiles of the Future, an inquiry into the limits of the possible, science fiction writer, Arthur C. Clarke, formulated his famous three laws, of which the third law is the best known and the most widely cited. And this is the law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now, that quote's never gonna run out. Because in 1962, what seemed magic seems banal today, right? And even t 10 years ago, what seemed amazing, like, you know, whatever it is, Zoom and, and everything we do and Twitter seemed amazing 10 years ago, seems banal today. Seems, Of course you've got Zoom, right? And I think this is where the intersection is. What is magic? What is tech? How does a regulator stay on the right side? And I think it's right. It needs all of us. It needs, whether it's, you know, startups like us, like Kananga doing, you know, advanced stuff, all of us, different standard charters, and the regulators to say, yes, you sometimes have to push a little bit. Because in the end of the day, should we have a better outcome for the customer? Yes, no one disagrees. But should the customer be safe? Yes. But data is a new oil, and data is hard, and it's, it's hard to work out. And if we build something that's magic, people will say, oh, you can't have it, it's too advanced. But in two years' time, people will be like, Oh, that's obvious. Like we knew that. So that law is never going to run out. Like the law is never going to stop. And it's how do we interpret that? How do we correctly? And all of us, it's not just on the regulators. It's not just on the incumbent banks. It's not just on the startups. Everyone's got to push a little bit to make sure it's right. And you're right. Look, privacy is crucial, right? Because we could lose a lot of trust if you get privacy wrong. And, you know, definitely, I know Sachin definitely. Uh, you know, uh, as you said, privacy in the titles thinks about that a lot. We do too, and I think that's that's the key question. How do we correctly get that balance right? Very cool. Thanks for adding your view. Um, I'd like to jump into privacy, the the conversation about privacy. But before we do that, just want to check if Mike or Sachin has anything to add to the question. Otherwise, we'll move on to the privacy conversation. Nope. Okay. Perfect. So I think. Uh, it is a very important discussion, the, the, the question of privacy, and, and Sachin did bring up some very good points about how there's two kind of uh, thoughts and, and philosophies going around. So I, I want to kind of zoom into how your organizations are dealing with privacy, managing, managing piracy. You know, uh, Maybe, Mike, you, you can go first. You, you can walk us through how InterSystems is doing that on behalf of the clients. Yeah, so I think Sachin touched upon it when it comes to privacy you know transparency is is very important you want to kind of know that your data uh what your data is right so being able to view it um i think there's kind of good strides uh over the last few years to, to be able to uh, provide that to to the consumers right it's their data um, but i think there's there's a bit of clarity that also needs to be added to that right i think while 
you can definitely kind of give views and make it transparent, but you know, formalizing it in a in, in a consumable form is another manner, right? And so just think about ultimately providing that data because you do own it, right? But I think the the biggest point I'm we're looking at is how do you help control it, right? So whether it's the regulators, whether it's uh, companies working together, uh, whatever form, but I think a lot, a lot has to be about how do you control that data, right? So if you can see it, that's one thing, but for the masses, for the different types of individuals across the world and you know all their data, how do you kind of help people properly manage their own data? I kind of think that's a very key point. I don't necessarily have the answer, but we've been talking about how do you how do you do that, right? And, and, it, and it really comes, you know, so I'll come into the regulation question there. So yeah, I agree that regulators aren't fully responsible for um, maintaining privacy, right? But I think they're the major player. I think it is a group that has to help decide because there's a lot of pieces that, that are at play here, right? If you think about it from a global perspective, there's uni uniformity around the different regions, right? So we're, we're talking about the you know, Malaysia here, but think about the US and then UK has, has, has GDPR, right? So there's a lot of things that are going across the world and it's not necessarily, it's not all the same across, right? And, and, and a lot of a lot of it is based on GDPR, like a lot of kind of new regulations have, have kind of uh, similarities. Um, but uniformity as it goes across regions, right? If you think about the world being very global, you kind of have to think about that. You know, completeness comes into the same kind, same same equation. Um, and I, I, I kind of come back to the control, like the implementation ultimately is very very important. Like how do you implement a lot of these privacy aspects, right? I think like each group, like like an Apple does it differently, uh, Facebook could do it differently, and and it, the how can be very challenging if they they don't work together, right? So as much as we want them to work together, um, I don't know. Do they even talk? First off, like um, I don't know. Um, um, so the last point I'll make is I think. The intent is right to have regulations to help with the privacy. Um, I think we do need better regulations. So I'll take that stance because ultimately I think regulations help, the, the goal is to protect the customer, right? And, and providing that safety to the customer, I think that opens up or increases trust, is, is I guess the way, right? So once you increase trust, then that allows everyone to be more open around what they do, and then you know openness. Then, in my opinion, in my opinion, then kind of allows for competition and diversity, which again, kind of benefits the consumer, right? So it's kind of kind of a full circle. Like I think privacy is a very key point that allows for the betterment of a lot of the things we do here, from a wealth management standpoint, from, from a financial services overall standpoint, right? I, I think kind of that whole whole circle is how, the way I view it, the way we talk with customers about it. Um, it's about how, how do you how do you build that into your app, right? How do you make sure that that happens? And I think, you know, we've come to an age where consumers are more and more acute about the knowledge about the importance of privacy. And to the extent that I think, you know, like what some of the panelists were saying, it's also up to the users to to share and disclose data, right? So if we as organizations are able to kind of demonstrate the value we can provide to them by sharing data with us, that's that's where we, we want to be able to 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 clearly show that to customers. Um let's move on to to Sachin and Dr. Seka to share their views. But unfortunately we've already gone about 45 minutes is, is the thing about these conversations it's you don't even realize time flies right so very quickly uh, uh sachin do, do you have anything to add to this uh, privacy conversation oh a lot oh a lot <laughs> let's do another two hours then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no no to, to be very honest like it's is 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 a very very kind of um uh important topic and um i'm, I'm sure the other panelists will will completely agree with me that this is this is it and and every organization is kind of struggling um, i can give you some examples twitter um, facebook apple giants infrastructure wise money wise everything still struggling on the privacy 
right? So data privacy is not easy. It's tricky. Um, um, regulations, GDPR, CCPA, PDPA, a lot of things, global, local. But uh, whenever I talk to 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 my team or or people whom I closely interact, and I can freely talk, and I'm I'm, I'm talking freely with you guys as well. Is one one again? I will use uh, net uh, the word magical or magic, which you really like, and and I think we can be will be great friends after that. So so um so so the the thing is that the the magical phrase I say that is don't capture if you don't use it. That's 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 that, that that's the uh, the philosophy and one more interesting topic and one of in in one of my podcasts which which I think I'm gonna make live in next one or two weeks so the topic which which I covered was the dark side of data and why the dark side of data is that if you based on my research and based on research done by Harvard Cambridge and other very reputed institutes are is the organizations are storing a uh, lot of data out of that only 23 percent of data sees the light of a use case that means 77 percent of the data is not being used and will never be used in the organization now look at the carbon footprint or look at the uh, uh, the amount of pollution data centers are adding global warming and all those things if you if you look at um, the latest data centers which has facebook has opened and singapore is one of the one of the places right they need huge infrastructure co2 emissions are huge and you will not be surprised that after 6 months you will uh, you will hear that you know data is the biggest polluter right not it's it's not petrol diesel it's 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 data which is which is making so i think uh, all these data points connect to this fundamental uh, understanding is that you should capture only what you need and use it the way you are authorized to use it and destroy it once you are that, that the use case is, is done records disc destruction data destruction is also one of the key ask of the regulators you can't keep on holding the data if the usage is done so i'm going to leave that um, uh, point and dr saker will will add his perspective i'm sure um, he'll he'll add few i think it's really interesting and it puts a whole meaning to the word data is a new oil when you say data is going to be the biggest polluter <laughs> like because i never imagined that word and the phrase in that context <laughs> but it is important i mean increasingly in the finance world we're talking about esg a lot and sustainability is a big team but uh let's let's jump on to uh dr seka to also add his views in this conversation so dr seka you have the floor yeah so customer data right i think um adding on to what uh sachin said and thank you for giving some space for me to say something and also what Mike said much earlier about your data journey should start from outside inwards, right? So from my, for my point of view, when you start your data journey from outside inward is you understand what the value that the data is supposed to create. So you don't, you don't go and collect all data there, then you keep it, then you decide what to do with it. You must know what you want to get to the customer. Then you collect only those data. That's when you drive your data value from outside inside. If you are going to collect, I mentioned well collect every damn thing, every full stop, every comma that the client has, every hyphen and every facial, every nonsenses, then, but you don't know what you're collecting it for. You actually will have AI built on rubbish. Right, you will have a good strategy of hyper personalization, but it's not your personalization and not your customer's personalization. Right, so starting it from outside in, and that's where I think you can draw the line between data privacy because you can actually tell the customer why you're collecting the data, you understand the data value, right, and that builds the trust at the point of data source with your customer. And that makes it work f best for you and your customer together. So you don't do what you are in line with the customer and, and in line with your business as well. So I think that will be the best way on how you protect your customer's data privacy as well. You know why you're collecting it. Your customer knows why you're collecting it. And the customer trusts to give, give it to you as well. Thank you. And I think, you know, I'm noticing a trend 
of more and more people from the industry realizing that you don't need to collect all the data because in the past conversations, so we talked a lot about the liabilities and the risks as well. So very good points over there. And uh, one of the audience is also kind of showing appreciation for, you know, pointing out the whole data as, as, as a pollutant, potential pollutant soft point. And that's, that's some, something that we could do some thinking around as well. Um, so before we move on to the next question, does Mike and Ned have anything to add to this? Nope. Okay. Um, Let's move on. Ned, you want to say something? Yeah, go ahead. No, I think it's just this, just this idea of the, the data. I love this idea of the, well, I don't love, I don't love that it's mm. a pollutant, but I love the thought mm. process that it has both sides, yeah. but also to the point whereby I think we all understand that anything has a positive and a negative, right? Everything, mm. everything in life, right? Well, maybe not ice. Well, I was going to say ice cream. Ice cream is pretty positive, but it has a negative as well, right? Um, <laughs> you know, but there's probably something that's only positive, you know, per se. But I think that's the right way to think about it because once you get it wrong with data, it's hard to come back from that. It, it really is. So, yeah, I think we covered it well. And, uh, yeah, let's step, yeah, move on to the next next topic. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, but I have to disagree with you. There's, there's, there's too much upside to ice cream to consider the downside. So I, I would, <laughs> fight, I would fight you on that point. <laughs> my, my, my favorite thing about these conversations is that you know before we start this session, I prepared like a list of questions, but we're not even using the questions anymore. There's so much interesting things that we're talking about. So I'm really appreciating like where the, the, the level of uh, insights that we're getting from these conversations. But I guess what I wanted to kind of also contextualize is um, I wanted to look at how, you know, what are some areas that you see organizations can really benefit from in harnessing data, but they're not doing so effectively. And also kind of walk us through what some of the challenge of, of, of uh, doing so. Um, maybe we can uh, start with Mike, and then we go Sachin, uh, Dr. Seka, and then Ned. Mike, you, you have the floor. So challenges. Um, I guess the, some of the major, major challenges that we're working on with our customers, uh, I mean, the simple one, right? It's about managing data complexity and diversity, right? Like there's so much data out there. Right, and they come in different forms, um, structured, unstructured, you know, how you get them, where, where they are. That's, believe it or not, very hard, right? And especially in the larger institutions uh, with all their legacies, right? So if you think about fast moving data, uh, more traditional data, you got your uh, legacy systems, your more contemporary ones, your external ones from the cloud. So, you know, a lot of pricing data and so forth, like, Bringing all that together is, is non-trivial for a lot of companies, right? And so we help manage that. Uh, and I think that's one of the things we, you know, firms are trying to solve, right? I mean, once you kind of start that and being able to get access and make that available, the next one is ultimately, what can you understand your data, right? It's like a lot of times you have a lot of data, you don't know what to do with it. You don't even know what it is. Right. And, you know, getting context and getting understanding the relationships of different pieces of data and how they pull together. That's very important. Um, data quality. I don't think I need to speak too much about it. Right. Like garbage in, garbage out. Um, major impact on modeling. <laughs> uh, you have pretty useless model just feeding it garbage. Um, I think also we help firms, you know, they're doing the transformation, uh, really kind of thinking about their, their uh, being agile on, on their data usage, right? So how can they make, you know, now they know they need to do this transformation. They don't want to do it twice. They don't want to do it ever again, honestly. And so it's about how do you, how can you make yourself agile in using your data, right? It's about how can you then adapt to new requirements going forward, like getting your true value and not having to redo this continuously. Um, and we spoke about how, you know, honestly, data is, we have so much data, so scaling is important. We have really fast data, right? So everything just continually just moves faster. Like you have your pricing data, you have all the, the social events, your life events, there's, uh, lifestyle events, as Dr. Secker said, right? Pulling all that together and being able to analyze that in real time, right? That's hard. 
So you really have to think about how you structure your, your, your how, think about your data strategy, how you structure your platform, making sure that you can honestly be able to be, you know, one of the key points is being agile, right? Being able to do all this predictive analysis, creating insights at the right moment in time and so forth. But it starts with basic building blocks. And if you don't have a strong foundation, that really puts you in, you know, you can only go so far. Um, and then, and then the last point, you know, one of the clients that we're starting to work with, are pretty far advanced, is now looking to reverse, right? They're saying, well, we have all these models. They're doing a lot of great things for us. But we also want to explain the ability. We want traceability. We want to, we want to look at data lineage. Because they need to understand kind of doing you know, simple A-B testing, kind of looking at why things have changed, um, whether it's adverse or not, or, you know, um, where there's more ethical kind of concerns around it. Um, but, you know, having that ability now, imagine you have to scrap everything. So, oh, we can't do that. That would be really bad, right? Um, someone's getting fired, right? So, um, you know, we help with people kind of thinking that through, you know, creating that strong foundation to then apply their, their models and, you know, that, that really data-driven kind of you know, view. So that's where, yeah, you know, I think those are the challenges we've been seeing and helping with. Thank you. Um, and what about you, Sachin? What, what challenges have you been seeing? How have you been addressing them? What opportunities do you see within the wealth management space? No, I think um, I, I, would, I would use kind of five Vs to kind of summarize that what, what are the challenges coming through, right? The way I see it's volume, it's velocity, variety, veracity, and value. So if we, if we look at these five Vs of, of data, we will see the challenges are this. And, 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 and Mike has very well summarized about the volume and veracity and the, the variety, right? Data agility, we all need data agility speed to market. But at the same time, the way the volume and the, the velocity of the data has created a big, big challenge. How do you crunch this, this amount of data? At the same time, the biggest challenge, what I, what I still see is fundamental. We, 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 say a lot about ourselves we have technology we have machine learning we have ai but we still struggle to make our data speak you know this is the fundamental struggle which is still going on and 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 again a phrase um, is data chaos to clarity right you have tons of data in the organization you don't need to go out anywhere but at the same time you own that data organization have the data but at the same time the biggest challenge is how to convert chaos to clarity and how do you make your data speak and how do you convert um, data storytellings which gives you a which gives you good insights and which increases the probability of making good decisions so i think um, for wealth management area or anything these are the same challenges but but ned has actually give us a great hope and I will repeat his statement that, you know, take the power from the customer itself and drive his his fortune or drive his future for the betterment of, of, of I would say that, you know, Ned, you should you should be considering yourself as a as a as a social business guy who wants to make money, but at the same time is helping the society. So this is this is one thing which I would I would and take it as a compliment, mate. So 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 this is it. I, I love the phrase taking the power from the customer. Everybody say customer is the king, customer is there, but actually you are taking the power from them for their own good right okay you can't drive the car let me drive your car it will be much more safer that's that's the whole idea so i think um yeah th that's my 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 last few words and i think maybe vincent over to you i think it's it's um quite unique to say to take the power because we always talk about empowering right so we, we take we empower by taking away power that's that's an interesting way of uh, thinking of things maybe net can go into that a bit more but let's quickly uh, jump to dr seka to talk about some challenges he sees and some some uh, ways to address them you have the floor dr seka uh you're on mute yeah. so <laughs> thank you uh the i think for challenges in the wealth managed industry uh I think it's uh, what I'm going to pick up one of the V's by the uh, uh, Sachin variety. 
Now it's more of a digital investment management. That's what robo and wealth management is all about. But we have not really gone to the state of wealth management itself. So I think one of it is for people to understand that you need to bring in more stuff into the whole uh, wealth management platform for, for you to collect more data, to get to build a trust with the customer. And I think the other biggest challenge is exploitation of data, not by the companies, but also by the robots itself. You know, if you don't watch uh, what the AI is doing, it, they can also become the evil genie and they can also be biased. So don't think that you got your act right in the first time round and it will stay right forever. Uh, that, that need, it's a continuous process. And the challenge is how do you manage the continuous process? Uh, and, and, and the data that's outside, external data, changes. Uh, COVID is something that never existed before in these times, right? And it has changed the whole outlook, prediction, and everything. So now how do you understand COVID like in the future? How do you predict it? And how do you apply it? Because goal settings are not going to be done within one day, two day, one year, two years. It's like five-year, ten-year plan. And to do predictive for a five-year, ten-year plan, the data is not collected once and then uh, matured. Data are consistently collected and the maturity is using it right and having a different scenario at every reiteration, right? And then how do you get your customer to understand hey, what I told you six months ago that this is what it's going to be, but now with new data, it's going to change, right? And that is one of the biggest challenge. How do you renew that trust with customer using data? And because the customer is going to be refreshed again with new investment advice and everything. So what you said six months ago doesn't work now, is it? How do I continue to trust? No, my data says this. Then at one point they go, they're going to ask you, how do I trust you or your data? What will happen in the next six months? I guess that's going to be a continuous challenge that we also have to put in in our journey to make sure that we mitigate that risk of uh, customer not believing us in the future. That's, that's some important considerations as well. Th thanks for raising this point. Um, let's move on to Ned and then we'll do one final question. Ned, uh, what are your views and, and you know your response to the whole taking power away to empower kind of thing? Yeah. Well, look, I appreciate it, <laughs> the, good, the good feedback, but I think you know, it, it, this is, you know, what's the challenge of data? The challenge of data is it's all new what we're doing here. We haven't done this before. This is new, you know, in the last 10 years. And, you know, it comes back, this idea of taking the power away, the sad reality is that humans are bad with money. You know, there's no, there's, history has shown us, right? It should be a simple game. There's only two moves you can make, save or spend. That's it. There's only two moves. But what we found out is like the game of Go. In the game of Go, there's only a couple of moves you can make, yet it's incredibly complex. And that's the problem with money. It's hard. It's really hard. And humans, historically, are bad at it. So this idea that we should always empower the customer to make choices about money, well, yeah, what, what's the phrase? Repeating the same behavior and expecting a different outcome is the definition of insanity. Some people are good with money, but most people are not. It's just like, a, it's a fact. So I think the idea is, we are empowering them by taking the power away, but the outcome should be, can you achieve a better financial outcome? I don't think there's anybody in the world who wants a worse financial outcome. Like, I, I, I truly don't think there is, you know? Everybody wants a better financial outcome. And how do we use data in the right way? And maybe I know we're coming towards the end of the time. How do we summarize it? The challenge is we haven't done it before. We, this is all new. Using data to plan people's financial life, it's new for all of us. And I, knew, I mean new in the last 10, 20 years over the life cycle of humans and wealth management, even wealth management is 100 years old, humans thousands of years. This is new for all of us. We, we're all guessing. And as you can tell, I like quotes, but you know, the quote is, predictions are, un predictions are hard, especially if they're about the future. So you know, that's, that's just the reality. So data is the way forward. Helping the customer is the way forward. What is the exact answers? We're all trying. We're all learning. There, there's different ways to do it. But I think if you combine two philosophies, I love Satchin's idea. Don't take data if you're not going to use it and only take data if you think it will help the customer. If you do that repeatedly, 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 the outcome will be good. That's, that's how we look at it. 
Thank you. And you know, I, I think there's some really good points that you brought up over there. And the other consideration is also not just because consumers are, are, are largely bad at managing money. It's just that it's also that they don't have time to constantly be looking at the portfolio. I right? guess not everybody's a day trader. Some some people have day jobs and they're like, hey, you know, help me take care of this. I don't I don't, don't, I don't have the time to look at this, right? So that, that that's some good exactly. considerations over there. So um, let's move on to some closing thoughts. Let's think about um, what are some big trends that you guys see in the near to medium term? You know, what are your predictions for the future of uh, data and, and wealth management? Uh, Mike, what do you think about that? Mike, you're on mute. Ah, Future on, of data. Um, look, I, I think what's going on is great, right, for the consumer. Like, there's going to be a lot of change. I, we talked about it's very customer centric, I think that's all great. Using the data across, we have to be concerned about privacy there, but I think overall it's for the betterment of the consumer. And I think that's good, right? Um, a lot of people are in the space. So there's, got a lot of, there's a lot of competition. So we gotta be, gotta look at what's gonna happen, whether it's just gonna be mergers, um, you know, I think there's gonna be a lot more parity about as everyone kind of comes up to speed over the next few years, I, I think there's going to be a lot going on. And so there's going to be a stress or a pressure on making sure that people continue to innovate. So it's about also being adaptable, right? To how do you continue to innovate, differentiate yourself from the next person, next company, right? So you kind of have, all have to have a lot of agility around that. I think even though there's going to be a wider customer base, I think there's just going to be that many more players. And so, again, the whole philosophy is what added value do you give to customers, right? So how do you personalize it? How do you, if everyone's personal, hyper-personalizing, what's next? Right, so then that draws the last point I'll make is about probability. You have to kind of look at this and see what happens, right? Um, as, as everything moves, we don't know. I think one of the things we, we've been saying is that there's a lot of things we don't know. And, and this is new as the bar, as this whole industry starts to change, you know, there's dynamics. I think at the end, I, I mentioned it's good for a customer, but there's a lot of players on the other side buying for those customers. And so, uh, you know, we, we kind of stress to people to make sure that you're agile so you can kind of adapt as you move forward. Um, that's my last thoughts. All right, thanks for that, Mike. Let's move on over to Sachin. Sachin, what is your closing thoughts in terms of the trends in 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 this uh, space moving forward? Yeah, I I think um a very interesting discussion, and and I I love all the panelist uh, points, and I learned a lot. Thanks thanks for it before because I just don't want to miss the opportunity to say thanks to them. So yeah, um my final thoughts will be um you know data agility and quality are are very key important aspects and and there has to be a significant kind of things to to go and application and adoption of of prediction as as net mentioned about you know um, uh, taking away the away the power to empower the the customer itself right is 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 there and i think um, one fundamental uh, um, thing which i would um, uh, like to reiterate or repeat myself is garbage in garbage out kind of stuff so so <clears throat> just 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 be respectful uh, about data and 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 we we all say data is the, is is the new oil the only thing which we need to really um, be be responsive is that treat that like a oil and it is a limited resources and um, um i i was reading one 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 article um that in last 2 years um humankind has has stored or captured the data uh, 90% of the data has been captured in last 2 years in the entire humankind right so you can imagine data has been from the from from even when there was barter system right the data was there since that time so in what has changed that last two years the human can, mankind it's it's a kind of rat race of you know hey capture more capture more and, and it it resonates the 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 top the point which dr saker says that okay goes back to the fundamental capture if you need it right it's like use case driven approach and and or maybe you know you go to the basics right so i think that that's the thing and again 
be mindful and this is very good thought for the listeners as well one of the one of the big research papers says that in next this with this the speed we are capturing the data nowadays come 150 years we don't have space to capture the data so what we going to do it so data destruction is also one of the most important theme which i think will will come up so that's my final thought thank you sachin let's move on to uh, dr seka what, what are your thoughts on this well if you ask me where uh, wealth management is going to grow right i think uh, as i said it's still at the infancy stage of wealth creation i think there will be more um, money management data that will be getting into the wealth management platform uh, and that will that's when the maturity gets placed because uh, will take place where we we will actually understand the customer better uh, because money management is very important factor that we don't collect now uh, extensively um, and the other part is i i think the robo advisory platforms itself are moving into a hybrid advisory already because the human factor in advisory is very important to keep the check and balance between the robo and also the human touch point maybe a digital avatar like uh, uh, like what uh, sachin said right however these two are uh, things that we we'll talk about maturity but in predictive way there are things that can throw spanners into the work uh data exploitation this definitely going to be one player out there who's going to collect data and exploit it right and the regulators are going to come down hard when they do that everybody who's doing it right will go affected as well right and 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 also ethical there's a lot of movement in uh, countries like australia and uh, uh, in europe that they are bringing up the case of uh, ethical use of data ai and everything right so um, so that is going to also uh, be a challenge in the, i mean predicting where it's going to go right so uh, data is not going to an easy journey for us especially when everybody is going to use it everybody needs it there are going to be challenges and the maturity of it i when it happens is going to be amazing for our customers and and all everyone of it but we need to know the hurdles that's going to happen as well and manage it from now because if you get it right from now and you keep it hygiene and ethical and everything you won't be affected and that's an opportunity for you to take the lead role in the future when that things happen right uh, and and this is what i think that's going to happen in the future with the wealth management and i one other thing that i predict is they are going to be Uh, convergence of different wealth products to come up with super wealth products because artificial intelligence is still being at the very general uh, state of its use right and that's going to go into more complex state of use of artificial intelligence and that when happens you're going to have an unimaginable product that is going to be super good and that that's where the race is going to shift not only on customer uh customer touch points or hyper personalization but productization as well right and that's that's where the future is going to be i believe but is it going to be magic as they say <laughs> well it'll be magical definitely for customers <laughs> profitability but you know when everybody is a billionaire then what's the point of becoming a billionaire it's common <laughs> <laughs> right, thanks, thanks for sharing it. So let's move right. on to Ned to share his views. Ned, you, you have the floor. Thank you. And actually, say, uh, Dr. Seika, you 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 brought up something I was going to mention, and also I'm going to answer Sachin's question about where to store the data. So let let if we just look 150 years, Sachin's 150, 200 years. Let's let's look right into the future. So wealth management works today because of imperfect data. People buy and people sell the same asset at the same time. They must have imperfect data because if we had perfect data, we would all buy at the same time and sell at the same time. Of course, if that happens, financial markets don't work. So, interestingly, maybe we don't want perfect data uh, accessibility because if everyone knew everything all at the same time, in in essence, markets don't work. So, I actually think there's an, a, a limit that we want to stop at, right? And to Dr. Sekar's point. Uh, it's right let's say we could absolutely always optimize everyone's financial life and life was so easy no one would have any purpose hold on like 
while, while sometimes we might grumble about going to work Monday to Friday, you need to have purpose, right? If everybody was maybe not a billionaire, but if everybody's a billionaire, what's the point? And we all sit around in some stupor of, oh, well, there's no point and we sit around, right? So I think interestingly, if we look so far into the future, data will limit ourselves as humans. We're smart enough to understand we actually don't want what we crave. We don't want perfect data because you couldn't make money more than the next person. We all have it. Uh, 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 all the markets are the same and everyone is optimized and everything's perfect. Except I think as humans, we don't want perfect. And I don't know many billionaires, but are all billionaires happy? Maybe they are, maybe they're not. I don't know, right? So I think I think there is a limit to how much data we want. And to finalize point, Sachin, I think we should open data centers on Mars because when we run out of places to store the data, I think if you say to Elon, where are, look at those images we just got back from you know uh, uh, the rover. And I think if you said to Elon, can you conceptualize that we would store data outside of Earth in another system? While that seems ludicrous, I think what we're doing today seems ludicrous to people in 1850. If you said we would be doing this Zoom call right now with humans in, around the world, ludicrous, ludicrous. So I think as humans, we're incredibly inventive. And I think data, I think we're going to find a limit where we're going to peek over the edge of data and go, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. OK, OK, actually, we don't we don't want that much, right? We, we'll take a step back and we'll moderate ourselves. And how that plays out in wealth, I don't know. but. Uh, I think we will self-moderate ourselves when data becomes too much, whatever that might be. Thanks for some of the controversial ideas, like ice cream <laughs> may be bad for you. Uh, let's not be billionaires. <laughs> but, but jokes aside, I uh, really appreciate everyone taking the time to join us. You know, I probably have like another 10, 15 questions I could have asked, but I think we have unfortunately run out of time. But the good thing about these sessions is that you know, we can be flexible with the timing. If there's something interesting, we, we always extend it a little bit. But yeah, you know, thanks for giving me something to think about. I hope uh, the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, you know, there's some comments here uh, talking about some of the points that was raised, you know, a lot of appreciation from the audience. So thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope you have uh, a good rest of the day and uh, join us again sometime in the future. <laughs> Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye.